The reading is taken from the book of Luke. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, regular members of the congregation will know, uh, and are probably sick of hearing about it by now, uh, that last month, when I was finishing my sabbatical, I spent a week in Northern Ireland. And as part of that week in Northern Ireland, I walked, well, I drove most of the be told, uh, the St. Patrick's pilgrimage route. I'm not sure if you're aware of St. Patrick, but uh, he's Ireland's patron saint, uh, and quite well known in, in Europe, certainly. Um, and uh, he, most of his mission was in Ireland, and in the north particularly, and his pilgrimage route goes from Armagh, which was the, the city where he was based for much of his mission, uh, and where St. Patrick's Cathedral is the centre uh, of the Church of Ireland there. Uh, and I, it finishes still in Northern Ireland, near the coast, where his tomb is at a place called Down Patrick, and that was the route I travelled. If you're interested in seeing some of my journey, uh, I did little five minute video diaries uh, and they're online on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you search for Tim Heaney, you'll find it. Right. What's that got to do with today? Well, my first Sunday back two weeks ago was the Feast of St. James. But actually, I used it to talk about my journey because St. James is the patron saint of pilgrims. Um, St. James. Uh, is, has a very famous church named after him in Spain called Santiago de Compostela, and that, that church is a, a major pilgrimage route. Uh, it has been since the Middle Ages. Uh, and the pilgrims who travel that route um, carry the symbol of St. James, and this is the symbol of St. James, the sculpture. shell. Uh, and if you, uh, you look around the church, there are little examples, not huge numbers of examples. If you come up from the at the altar rail, you'll see the the sculpture on the cushions there. Uh, but in particular, what we have now, apologies to those in the South Island who can't see it, um, is this beautiful work of art, uh, which, is, which is a sculpture. And um, this is now a permanent addition to our church. So St. James is the patron saint uh, of pilgrims. The sculpture is his symbol, but it has become the symbol of all pilgrims, whether you're doing the St. Patrick's pilgrimage or Santiago or whatever, this is now the symbol of pilgrims. So, so it was appropriate to talk about pilgrimage my first Sunday back on the Feast of St. James. But I'm going to continue to talk about that theme a little bit today, uh, but in terms of the, the pilgrimage of life, it, there's a sense in which our, our life journey is a pilgrimage. Uh, this was a theme I preached on two weeks ago. Uh, you can also watch that sermon online on our church YouTube channel. Um, and I'm going to pick up that up today, but I'm going to particularly talk today about the role that the church plays in our pilgrimage journey, because little Stephanie is going to be baptised today, and she's going to become a member of the church. Uh, and what I'm going to do today, which we don't do very often, is actually I'm going to use this sculpture, so when I baptise her, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I will, I will use this just to show that she is beginning her pilgrimage of faith. This is the, she becomes a member of the church today and she begins her pilgrim journey. In Rob's reading, we heard him talk about how it was the custom of Jesus' family at the feast of the Passover every year to travel to Jerusalem to go to the temple to celebrate the feast of the Passover. And for many of us, it's special festivals are probably the main times that we come to church. We come to church 
Um, uh, make your invention. Can you think of any special festivals where, where we might, what time of year, something special where we might come to church? Um, Christmas. 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 Brilliant. Well done, Mika. Christmas and Easter. Prime festivals for Christians at a time when even people who don't normally come to church will come to church. So there are certain seasons and certain times of year that where, we come, where people come to the church to celebrate. Um, but there are other things we come to church to celebrate throughout the journey of life. Right at the very start of our life, little Stephanie is coming to church to be baptised. We're, we're celebrating her life today. We're saying thank you to God for her. Um, there's a sense in which we're particularly thankful to Stephanie, um, aren't we, Henry? We, we, there's a special reason why you've come to this church today, uh, and maybe I'll ask you to share that later on. So we'll be giving thanks for Steffi, but we're also baptising her. But then, of course, people come to church for their weddings. We had a wedding here yesterday, you've seen the flowers on the door there. Uh, and then um, maybe after you're married, you come back to have your children baptised, as you have. And then, of course... Um, you know, sadly, people come back at the end of their lives. They come back for their funerals. People come here. We've got a, uh, a very well-known person of the village whose funeral uh, Thanksgiving service is going to be here soon, Charlie Hunt. So, so throughout our lives, we come to church for special occasions. We come to church uh, to celebrate. We come at sad times. We come at happy times. Baptism, traditionally, is the beginning of that journey. Of course, you can be baptised as an adult at any age of your life but often you come right at the start of your journey as a child. In a little while, we'll be making our way to the back of the church, to where the font is, to baptise Steffi. And there's a reason that the font is at the back of the church. It's by the door. It's near where we come into the church. Symbolically, baptism is the way we enter to the church, so the font is by the door to the church, so that that's the way that we enter. In the very first video of my journey to Northern Ireland, uh, I talked about what is it that makes us human? What is it that makes us who we are? And I said that essentially it's, it's mind, body and spirit. That's what makes a human being, those three things together, mind, body and spirit. And it's, it's your, your bodies, everybody I see before me looks different. Uh, but also your mind, your experiences, your knowledge, uh, your relationships, that's part of who you are as well. But also as Christians, in fact all people of faith, we believe that you have a spirit as well. The spirit of God is within you. I think it's within everybody, even those who aren't baptised, because we're all created in God's image. God made all of us in, in, in his way. Uh, so, so there is the spirit of God in all of us, but... Um, for us to be fully human, we need to fire up that spirit as much as we can. Um, I use the example of a phone. A phone is, is obviously physical, it has a, it has a body, it also, it also has data and memories and programs within it, okay? And, and you need both. You can't have a mind without a body, uh, and a body without a mind it isn't, it isn't really alive. But also, um, Within, within this, there is a light. There is a, there is a light in here, and there is a light in each one of us. We said, you know, the light of Christ coming into Steph. Um, but without power, that light doesn't stay bright. And so we need, we need to plug into something to, to energise us and to fill us. Uh, and of course, that energy comes from God. We plug into God. So... That's why people here don't just come to church at Christmas and Easter and weddings and baptisms and funerals. Many of the people here come every week. Some, some of us more than once a week. <laughs> um, uh, and they do that to connect with God, to have the light within them, the power of God to light that spirit within them. And you know, we need to exercise our bodies, we need to exercise our minds, but we have to strengthen our spirits as well. And coming to church, it's one of the key ways of doing it. Coming to church, singing hymns, hearing talks, uh, and in particular, receiving communion as well. And I'll say a little bit more about that. And of course, one of the key ways to connect with God is through prayer. We talk to God and we listen to God. And that's how we keep this light bright. 
So um, doing the St. Patrick's Field Surgery wasn't the only thing I did in my week in Northern Ireland. I did various things. Uh, one of the things I did was I tried to track down my family roots. My surname, Heaney, is an Irish surname. And my family, over 100 years ago, came from Northern Ireland over to the UK. Um, I just started to talk about the importance of communion, uh, and I took communion twice while I was away. Uh, the first time was in Armagh Cathedral, the Church of Ireland Armagh Cathedral, so, so an Anglican church, and I received communion there. But on the Thursday of my week, I went to the Roman Catholic Church, where my ancestors used to go, where my great-great-great-grandfather was married uh, over 150 years ago. Uh, and they were having a communion service there, a mass as they call it, uh, and I received communion there as well. So once in a, an Anglican church and once in a Catholic church. Uh, and for me, both were special moments that kind of drew my week together. Um, the interesting thing, I don't know if we've got any Roman Catholics or ex-Roman Catholics here, uh, but um, I'm not sure whether technically I should have actually taken communion because I'm, I'm not a Roman Catholic myself. I mean, my, my grandfather was a Roman Catholic and all the Heenies before that, but, but my, my father and I are not. Um, but I took it anyway, and I don't think they knew, and I don't think God uh, would mind. One of the things that we are very clear on as an Anglican church is that we do not limit communion to Anglicans. This is the Lord's table. We have not baptised Stephanie into the Anglican Church, we've baptised her into the worldwide church. Uh, and so we're trying to build a church that is really welcoming to everybody. And so when we take communion in a little while, if you're baptised, whether you were baptised Methodist, Baptist, Orthodox, Roman Catholic, whatever, if you were baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are very, very welcome to come up and receive both the bread and the wine, or just the bread, if that's your... Um, tradition. Um, in a moment, uh, I'm going to give Stephanie this candle, uh, which we are going to light from this candle. So this is symbolically, this is her baptism candle, and symbolically this is the light of Christ, which will remind you that she has the light of Christ within you. Some people like to light them on birthdays, bring them back for confirmation, stuff, that, that kind of thing. So this will be our gift to you. Um, one of the, I, I didn't mean to sound critical of the Catholic Church earlier on, I, I'm not, but I, but I do think it's a shame that they are more open and welcome when they give you communion. And I talked about how, how we are aiming to be fully welcoming. But one thing I, I do quite like is, is the way that they, they call Holy Communion the Mass. I don't know if you know why they call it the Mass. It's from the Latin that they say at the end of, when well, they used to do it in Latin, at the end of the service, they would say, uh, Ite missa est, go, you are sent, you are dismissed, go, okay? So miss, dismissal comes from that. But it, it's, it's more about, it's not just ending the service, it's actually about sending out. Uh, and I want to be clear that whilst it's really important to come to church, to have your batteries charged up, to have that light within you fired up, um, this isn't what it's all about. What it's all about is what happens out there. We come in through that door, through baptism. We process through the church. We receive God's holy gifts. The east end of the church where the sun rises. And then at the end of the service, we go out again into the world and we take the light of Christ with us. Now, that's not to say that God is only in the church and we take him out into the world, to a God-forsaken world. God is just as much out in the world as here but people often don't see him. People don't often recognise the hand of God at work in their lives. And sometimes it's up to us to take that light within us outside and shine it into those dark places. So when, when I give you Stephanie's candle now, yes, it symbolises the light of Christ in her. But as we walk towards, we won't go out, out, we'll walk, but as we walk back towards the door, carrying that light, it symbolises that we are supposed to go out Missa Est, go out into the world and take that light with us and be a light to the world. That's part of our pilgrimage and part of our journey as well. Dear Lord, 
We give thanks to you for this joyous day when we celebrate and witness the baptism of Stephanie and the official beginning of her Christian journey. We pray that she and her family and godparents will continue to know your love, trust and grace through their lives and feel your comfort and guidance as they face the challenges which life will bring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This morning, we also pray for the life of Charlie Hunt, for peace and eternal rest in your arms. We pray for all his family and all their wider friends. May they know your comfort and that you, Lord, are with them in their loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those youngsters who are anxiously awaiting their A-level and GCSE results. In particular, we pray for those for whom the results will bring stress, disappointment, and a time of difficult decisions at this junction in their young lives. May they be supported, encouraged, and loved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church, for Tim and Diane. As we approach the time of Holiday Club, we pray, thank you, Lord, for the energy, care and commitment of the team. We pray for all the organisers, the helpers and the children taking part. May your voice and your teachings of love be at the centre of their fun and excitement of the week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, we pray for our beautiful but rapidly suffering planet. After the world's hottest week in the hottest month of the last 120,000 years, we pray for governments in this country and throughout the world to listen to scientists and experts and to make the rapid decisions needed to end the burning of carbon. We pray and give thanks for all those extraordinary people across the world who are bravely campaigning to stop rainforests being destroyed, marine life from being completely decimated, for an end to the use of plastics which are filling the seas and the end of drilling for new sources of oil and gas. We pray that people will listen to and understand the truth, scale and consequence of climate change and the decimation of biodiversity. Lord, please give every one of us the strength to act now and enable a viable future for our children and the children of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 